Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack It Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Three stakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito Hey, buddy. Sorry about that. Hello. You're good. All right. Let me just check watch party real quick to see if we're doing anything. <clears throat> or if anybody's writing anything, rather. Are you? Hello, everybody. It's Kirk and Josh Bo coming to you once again with a real live Mavs Moneyball After Dark. I regret to inform you the Mavs fell to the Rockets. 153 to 149. Josh, everything old is new again. How are you doing? I'm I'm doing okay. Uh I feel like we could talk for three hours right now. Like yeah, yeah. that was an like unbelievable therapy game. session. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was an unbelievable yet completely believable game. Like just oh my gosh. I don't even well, know where to start. Let's let's, you know. Because I have a rep, I have a reputation, a well earned one. Let's start with some of the stuff that was that was pretty awesome. So the the three nicks that we received in the Chris Tapps Porzingis trade that were active: Porzingis, Trey Burke, and and uh, Hardaway Junior. combined for ninety four points. Chris Tapps Porzingis. <laughs> That's wild. Chris Tapps Porzingis played a excellent all around game. He had thirty nine points. He grabbed how many uh, 16 rebounds, which is outstanding. He had a couple of steals, some really sweet dimes. Um, he, you know, despite me complaining about his post-ups in game, it, it might have been one of the best all-around performances I can remember from him that felt real. Like some of the stuff that happened in February and March did not feel real. So that was outstanding. Trey Burke also also became like the human torch for I don't know, about 20 minutes of the game and really kept uh, kept pace with Dallas as they poured in something preposterous. How many points did they have at the half? I like 95, no, 95, no, 80 something, 85. Like 80, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was 85, 75. So it was 160 combined points, which is the most for any team or any two teams and a half this year uh, in, in the 2019, 20 season. So, I mean, at least that was something is there is, is there, you know, there, there are other good things. What, what did you, what did you think? Uh, you, you took a lot of the good things. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, the fact that the team looked kind of weird in the first quarter, I think it was good that they kind of got their ass in gear in the second quarter and they looked really good. Um, I think they kind of woke up. Uh, I think that they, <sighs> I'm so mad about this game. It's hard. Like you, Kristaps, Hardaway, and Burke. That was those were the things that were great. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you look at the box score, and you look at what everyone else contributed. And you know, Luca had a very uneven game, and then everyone else kind of didn't do too much. So, uh, and the defense wasn't good. Um, but the team shot 21 of 49 from three, which is bananas. And I know a lot of that is Burke and Hardaway and, and Chris Stops. Um, I think we could, we maybe should singularly shout out Hardaway for how our concerns in the scrimmage games and yep. the storyline of how, you know, he is the make or break kind of player for this team. If he can, if he was going to be able to pick up where he left off and he did right. five of eight from three. Uh, he looked good. He took maybe one or two shots. I was like, eh, okay, but five of eight from three and seven of seven from the free throw line, five rebounds, three assists, 24 points. Like that's golden. Like that's, you can't really expect much for, more from him uh, in a game like tonight. Yeah. And you know, 
it's crazy because in a game where you score 149 points, there shouldn't there should be more good stuff. Like I highlighted <laughs> yeah, I know. one thing. I, I highlighted one play that I, I you know I just want to talk about it. Those Luca started the second quarter and he he did what I guess is is you know the technical term is an Iverson cut towards the hoop where he got a, a pass off the bounce and scored an easy layup. And I just you know, I talked to Jonathan Sharks yesterday about, you know, them using Luca off ball. And he was very blunt and said that he thinks that a lot of it is what Luca wants. And, and that is likely true. But like Luca has to, at some point, I wonder if it'll be pointed out to him in the offseason that he works so hard. Like tonight, all of his points were so difficult. You know, even though he's getting to the rim, he's having to like go side to side. There's no clear paths. There's no easy baskets except for that one. And I, I did, I really did at least like that. It was, but it's just, it's, it's kind of crazy. I think, you know, let's, let's just, let's dive, let's dive into, to, you know, the, the muck. Should we, about, <laughs> should we talk about the muck of the fourth quarter or should we talk about, uh, cause I can't I, decide if it's the muck of the fourth quarter or, or Coach Carlisle, like, sticking with a broken Seth Curry who looked like a man out of time, like he had never played basketball before. He was horrendous. And, uh, you know, it's it's not solely on him, but, I mean, he was a team worse negative 12 in 23 minutes. Like, yeah. that can't happen. What, he had three? Did he have two or three fouls in the first, you know, quarter? Yeah, he fouled or out. Yeah, which so is, I, you know that's part of it. That's how Houston yeah. played. So I don't really want to kill him too much. But I, I, I think th- the early foul trouble completely threw him off because he had to sit early, and I don't think he ever recovered from that. Well, and frankly, the way Houston defended tonight, when you have a bunch of six seven guys running at you all the time, it's distracting because he's shorter. So, but you know, when you pair you pair his um, you know his just utter ineffectiveness with how long they left him out there, that was a key part of the game because. One thing that Trey Burke was doing that nobody else did, at least in the second quarter, was like moving, relocating, passing, making the extra pass. And that fourth quarter, the Mavericks did none of that drive and kick stuff that they had been doing. The second quarter was incredible. There were multiple like two and three drive and kick instances where Dallas gets a wide open shot that they're buried. And in the fourth quarter, they just had none of that. And I don't understand why. I think it's twofold, at least tonight. The first one is it's the Mavs being falling into lazy habits that we've chronicled this entire season. They get a lead and they try to nurse it. And they, you know, a lot of people say it online. They they play like they're trying not to lose instead of, you know, trying trying to win. And, you know, they 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 milk the clock, they isolate. Luca holds the ball, pounds the ball, takes a bad shot. So they did all that, all those bad things. But what really compounded it, I think, was the combination of the Mavericks falling into their typical bad clutch offense habits. And then the Rockets, I think, went up a gear in the fourth quarter defensively. Um, I know you wouldn't consider the Rockets a staunch defensive team, and especially when you consider you know, the Mavericks made 21 damn threes on 49 attempts. Um, but they, in the fourth quarter... They extended their defense so that the Mavericks, so instead of reacting to what the Mavericks were doing, I felt like the Rockets were kind of imposing their will on the Mavericks. They were guarding, you know, you know how the Mavericks have their spacing where they, they aren't just beyond the three point line. Some of their guys are two or three feet beyond the three point line to give them some of that extra spacing. And the Rockets were out there like Robert Covington, PJ Tucker. They were guarding those guys without the ball all the way out beyond the three point line, not letting them get easy catches. And on the catch, they were right. You know, they were right in their shorts. Like the, the Rockets guarded really aggressively and the Mavericks didn't have a counter. Like they just, that beat them and they didn't know what to do. And, you know, you can, when you're when a team's playing that aggressive, you can use that aggressiveness against them by drumming up some off ball movement, doing some other thing, you know, doing some other things. But when the Mavs fourth quarter offense is everyone standing around and watch Luca do something, the Rockets playing that type of defense, like it was the perfect storm. It was the perfect uh, combination of things to make the Mavericks kind of fall apart. Like uh, credit is- to the Rockets for for ratching it up, but the Mavericks played right into it. But it, it, is it a perfect storm if it's happened 15, no, right, 22 yeah, times? Like, what I'm, <laughs> they, they lost 22 clutch time games this year. At a certain point, it stops being like a perfect storm. 
and and frankly, it's on Luca and then secondarily Carlisle to do something. Right. It's, I, it's it, like call a timeout and like put the fear of God in them. They score so well out of timeouts. There were a few really like that was how they they really kind of kept pace in the first quarter by by just you know and in the second quarter, frankly, you know when they when they had this lead. And I just I don't understand what's happening. And yeah, because I see what you mean. You know, they're they're they went at one point they scored. Um, I, I want to say twelve points in the first five minutes, which was below pace for where they were. But in a like normal NBA game, you know, if, if you score 25 points a quarter, you're doing okay. So they were like on an okay pace. And then from 642 to 137, they had one make. No free throws, no nothing. That is a that is a, a fundamental failure from top to bottom beyond just Luca. Because I know that we feel like he holds the ball too much and over dribbles it. But, you know, there are these really interesting things that the Mavs could do called cut that they don't. They just don't. And and I sometimes they do. Like there was a – Luca sometimes expects it, and I think this is where we're running into a little bit of a, like, you know, back in the back in the habit and then just kind of an unfamiliarity with, with these kind of lineups. I don't know. This just – it's I don't understand and I want to understand and I feel crazy. <laughs> oh, I know. And I should have reiterated what I meant perfect storm. Not that like, obviously it's happened a ton. I think I meant was the fact that it, when that happens, the Mavericks kind of run their crappy, no movement offense. I think it just got exasperated by the, the Rockets switch in defensive intensity, because even when teams are not doing that, the Mavericks still play like that crappy offense in the fourth quarter where they don't move. It's just, I felt like the combination of the Mavericks kind of doing their crappy fourth quarter offense, plus the Rockets changing up their defense a little bit to be a little bit more intense was just like, it like made it double bad, but I agree. Like it's, it's guys aren't moving guys aren't screening. Uh, it's this, like, I don't know what, how many times on this podcast do we need to say it? like I don't I'm running out of ways to describe their fourth quarter offense because it's the same it's the same thing it's it's bad shots at the end of the shot clock it's no movement and then what's funny is it's punctuated by the fact that the what should have been the dagger happened because of off ball motion we're Which, yeah, in the corner. Just, yeah it's incredible and because kp like, moved into the paint and forced the rockets to make a decision maxi got a wide open look and I so you like know, where is that? Where is that the other like the other ten possessions in the clutch or however many they have? I just the way the variety of ways that they lose these games that you know like the the non box out from Maxi who like let me be clear love Maxi Maxi ha- is is solely responsible for a number of late game super gaffes that are well beneath his like he's he's a good player but not boxing out roco was embarrassing it's just like whenever he rotated onto lebron james for no reason uh at that laker game at the start of the yeah. season when the Mavs yeah. were up three like what are you doing i, I yep. just i don't understand these sort of like like mental farts that the mavericks have down the stretch you know, no one boxed out nobody boxed out they <laughs> no like one. him and kp were both like like they were you know getting shoved together and it's like guys like this is the only way, the only way they can win. There wasn't enough time. There was like sport. There's three seconds left. You just get the rebound and get someone. Out. It's over. It's over. And I just, I can't, I can't. And, I and you know, know, Seth Curry, I was there. I, I, I may do this just because I'm an asshole. I may look at his 2020 only free throws, but I was there in DC when he and Hardaway just missed tons of free throws against the Wizards during one of their horrifying like clutch losses. Him going three for six as an 84% free throw shooter is just abhorrent. Him and yeah. Luca are responsible for seven of the nine Maverick free throw misses in a game that went to overtime. It cannot happen. Like yeah. you wrote a great article that went up today that, you know, of course, <laughs> when it, when it goes up, when it goes up, you know, I, I got a little Mavs pushback on the fact that we're, oh, you picked today to post this. And it's like, well, Luca shot one for nine from three and five for nine from the, from the three point line. So maybe Luca, whether he can shoot or not is a legitimate question because right now the answer is a firm. No, he is. He's an yeah. MVP candidate that can't shoot. And it's kind yeah. of incredible. Yeah. His what a I, we can get into his line. What a weird game! Like 
28 point triple double 28 points 13 rebounds 10 assists but yeah one of nine from three five of nine from the free throw line eight turnovers 11 of 27 from the floor like so like he ended up being a, a zero like plus minus he was a flat zero what a week like just such an uneven game where he had the glimpses of that dominant uh luca where he seemingly gets to the rim at will and scores whenever he wants but then he he missed a couple that i thought he normally could make uh inside the three-point line and then he you know all the three-point shots he made his first and then man the next i mean he didn't uh, rim eight, on yeah they were shot. bad they were bad misses uh and he was really loose with the ball uh, how many times did he get stripped tonight so that okay, was crazy. That's one thing I, 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 if if I were a better blogger, writer, podcaster, I'd go look at this, but I'm not gonna. But I will say that the Rockets, it felt as if they played superior defense and poked him low, like almost all of his strips came as he admit. You know, James Harden was doing the Dirk Nowitzki thing where he yeah. would swipe like past, you know, as the guy thought he was gone. That happened to Luca at least twice against Harden. And he got off like two or three of his turnovers happened in the first quarter. And then he kind of, then he kind of got it together for most of the game. And then he had two or three in the fourth and overtime. It was bad. And and just too loose. I don't get it. Can I have a, uh, let me bounce this theory off of you because you would probably agree. Luca got his ass beaten up tonight. Like I think the Rockets made a point of trying to hit like, is it me or like I don't know if you've heard the story uh, in the NFL when the Seattle Seahawks had that really great secondary with Richard Sherman? They would say I think they said in interviews later that they're like, yeah, we're doing pass interference. We would we would hold and grab jerseys and do stuff every single play because we knew that the refs would not call us for holding on every single play. And I almost won like the way the Rockets were going after Luca with strips and hacks and getting their hands, you know, in his into his dribble. I almost wonder if that was a point tonight to beat up Luca and realize the hey the refs aren't going to foul every single one of us out of this game. So when Luca gets starts dribbling in the inside the three point line, let's beat the shit out of him and see if they'll see how many fouls they'll call. Like that's almost what it felt like they were doing. And and the thing about you know, a lot of people compare Harden and Luca, and the main difference right now between the two of them is base strength. Luca is incredibly strong. Don't get me wrong, but where Harden is able to get calls that Luca cannot is Harden is a real master of looking off balance at times when he's not. So the slightest bumps the ref assumes is a foul. Whereas you know there's the the, the very last possession Luca had, Doncic or I'm sorry, uh, uh, Harden body bumped him three times outside of the three point line alone. It, I mean, they're all fouls, but he didn't get the call. And it's the sort of thing where you know I'm really I, I'm kind of low key worried. Like Luke is going to eventually learn to like flop in like really horrific <laughs> ways that drive us crazy because yeah. that's the only way he's going to get some of these calls. I yep. mean, Luca gets a lot of calls. Like our fans don't think he does because it, it he gets hit so much, but he's a top ten. Uh, guy in in fouls like like you know uh, awarded to I guess is uh, whatever the hell the terminology is it's it's very it's very frustrating I don't know what to do about some of this it's you know I can like I can make a difference what's wrong with me I I don't know <laughs> this is this is this yeah. is, it's just so familiar I mean, I'm not even yeah. like I'm not even really mad like I like I'm gonna have to take a shower I'm like really sweaty like this <laughs> <laughs> like I'm so I mean I, but then the flip side like. <sighs> Talk to me about how you feel about like the actual games being back because I know you've kind of struggled a little bit with the presentation. I I had a great time up until they crapped the bed. Yeah, I think I think I've been good with the the presentation, like in terms of making it not look like a like I think we said this during the scrimmage. It doesn't look like a high school game. Like the way they got those video boards to cover the entire arena so that you can't see any empty seats. That's like a genius idea, and I know. I'm about to reveal some colors here, but it, pro wrestling is still doing shows and, oh, they yeah, did, yeah, yeah. and they did a really smart. And I think the NBA, maybe, I don't know if they, if someone watches pro wrestling in the NBA and, and told them to do this, but what they did when they started doing their fanless shows is, you know, if you've ever watched pro wrestling, the camera, the main camera angle has always got the crowd in the background. Right. So when they started doing these fanless, uh, 
events, they shifted the hard camera to the entrance. So you didn't see any seats. You just see the wrestlers coming down to the ring from the entrance, no seats. So I think that this way of broadcasting the games without showing the empty seats makes it feel more, I don't know, real, legitimate, not as off. Like, I really like that. That's a nice touch. Um, My issue with the presentation was just, you know, I, what are you going to do? They're, they're going to do the sports are back. America is back kind of, you know, like that's, I don't want to get into it, but that's, that's the stuff that's going to make me mad as things are going on. But uh, that's like something I, it's I have to deal with. Like, of course they're going to do that. It's it's sports. It's hokey. They're going to be hokey. Well, which broadcast did you have? Did you watch the Dallas or the local yeah the the, 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 the local Fox Sports uh, broadcast okay, so with Followell Harper and and Skin? I watched ESPN because that's what I had, and ESPN did a phenomenal job where they talked early and often about you know they when they interviewed Carlisle. I mean, frankly, they they asked him during the sideline interview about the stuff he's been doing before all of his uh, early pressers, where he's basically talking about an incident of uh, like police brutality, I think, and uh, you know, and and some of the really you know interesting things that the league has done. And you know, it didn't feel like I understand what you mean, where it, it can feel a little like forced. But this, I, I I've liked yeah, what I NBA's know. done overall. I think that that it's it's not too much i'm going to be interested to see like how it goes for three months because yeah. that is, that's that's where i think they run into like you know where it just it, it, it not gets old because that's the that's not how it should be but it just where its reception is is people just are, are less and less interested in some of that which is dis you know it's disappointing we shouldn't be as a society we should actually give give a crap but you know what are you going to do um that's not our call we don't control people um yeah. Otherwise, you know, I'm I'm glad they're back now. I'm a little the Mavericks' destiny is now largely, you know. I let me just go look at the standings because I wrote about it without knowing what the standings were entirely. But the Mavericks, hey, while you're looking up standings, can I call out our former boss Tim Cato for predicting Delon Wright scoring 20 plus points tonight? And yeah. he had five points in 15 minutes. Yeah, Timmy, big Timmy Jim. Out. If if this makes its way back to you, Tim. I don't believe you that you watched the scrimmages because DeLon Wright was hot trash for three games. He was also not good (laughs) in this game. Sorry. Okay. So the Mavericks have not officially made the playoffs yet, but they, they, from what the, you know, like Matt Moore tells me they've made the playoffs. It's just a kind of a matter of, of when and what happens in these other games. The disappointing part now is, is that even though, you know, they played three more games than the Rockets, and that sort of thing gives the rock because a lot of this will be decided by winning percentage, and uh, no, the entire it will be decided by winning percentage. So this this loss to the mat uh, to the Rockets is really like a double loss in the sense that what happens now is going to be entirely on what the teams in front of them do. The Jazz beating uh, the Pelicans the other night is you know very frustrating. Uh, the Mavericks may may really be just locked into the seven spot i i don't know yeah it, i i i gotta i gotta crunch some numbers uh yeah right we'll see if i actually do this but it, it's it's very that sort of thing stinks because like they, they had such hopes and and that's where it's just such a crushing crushing beat loss yeah. in the sense of of now to the what sort of incentive do they do they have to win like i hate saying that but it, I'm sure they will just because they probably want to avoid the Clippers at all costs, but it just, it feels very, this line might be the Clippers. <laughs> yeah. Can I, can I bring up a point as I'm looking at the box score and kind of thinking back over some stuff in the oh, game? Yes. Uh, oh, yes. This didn't, this feel like a game where the Mavericks wing depth and lack thereof really killed them. Oh yeah. Uh, like Justin Jackson played eight minutes and DeLon Wright, who is like the next best thing they have to like a wing, even though he is a guard, he played 15. So Dorian Finney Smith only got to play 28 because of foul trouble. They and Maxi had to play 34 minutes. So the, the they actually played Kristaps and Maxi together a lot. Yeah, and that's lot. not fair. You know, Max, you know, praise Maxi for 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 the effort he gives on the defensive end because he really gets put into not ideal situations because he just kind of has to. And like the fact that he had to guard a wing for most of the night, you know, it helps that the Rockets kind of have a standstill. Everyone watch Westbrook and Harden offense. So, but that's tough. Like the Mavs, the Mavs desperately need like one more 
starter quality player that is six seven. Like, yeah. God, do they need that right now more than yep. anything in the world? Yep. I I actually got a couple of DMs during the in the post game from various friends of the pod uh, who who said just that, and it's just this, this is what we knew. This is where you yeah, can't right. be too mad. Like yeah. the, the the incidents where like I was mad and kind of will will remain mad looking back is there was like five different possessions that game where the Mavericks or Dorian Finney Smith chose to do way too much. And and that's that's just indicative of the depth that you're talking about, where when they put him in the position where he is t- trying to take guys off the dribble or pat, you know, do basically making dis- decisions that aren't dribble once and pass, dribble once and shoot. Dr- right. or and just shoot like that should be the extent of his decision making right. i don't know um but yeah well, the clutch thing sucks because it's like it's one of those things where it's we could talk about it till our, our heads fall off and we can write about it and like how to it's it's not going to happen this year they're yeah. not it's not going to be something that's going to get fixed until they get more experience maybe some roster upgrades and maybe some more off-season internal improvements like there's yeah. there's no switch that i think that they're going to be able to flip that solves the way they play in the fourth quarter because so much of it is predicated on your best player is 21 years old and your second play, best player is 24 years old and has never been on a winning nba team before you yeah. can't get around that you know yeah and luca shot the ball better from distance last year in clutch time it's not a huge sample size but when it's enough, it like you just notice it, and and that has been the difference in a lot of these close losses. So it, yeah, it kind of is and isn't. I don't know, man. Well, all right, it's almost shoot. It is one in the morning my time. Oh, no. um, I have to I, I have to get up and be a excellent father tomorrow. I will report <laughs> back on if that's even possible. Um, as for you, I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. If, uh, you know, guys check back to the site, we have been putting out incredible content for about three weeks now, and we are going to keep pace because as you can tell, if Josh and I can ramble for a half an hour, then, uh, the good people of Mavs Moneyball can certainly write words on games and things that we're seeing. So, uh, we'll be back with you Sunday night. I'm pretty yep. sure. So Sunday. All right, this has been Kirk and Josh with Mavs Moneyball After Dark. We will talk to you later on. Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, Just go to cars.com. It's magical.